I once spent three months building a system that nobody asked for. I loved it. It was reusable. It was future-proof. It was the most beautiful, over-engineered piece of garbage I've ever created. And I built it because I was following advice that sounded smart. Advice from senior developers. Advice from AI. Advice that made me feel like a real engineer. But that advice sucked. Today, I'm gonna to share the five worst pieces of backend coding advice I've ever followed. Not because they're obviously wrong, but because they sounded so right that you'll nod along while they sabotage your progress. If you've ever felt like you're doing everything correctly, but still moving slowly, this video is for you. So let's get into it. Bad advice number one, the Formula One mistake. This is the advice that I learned the hard way and I'm not even exaggerating. Let me tell you what exactly happened. I was working at my second job as a developer and my team needed a new API endpoint. It was honestly a simple request. Users should be able to filter products by price range. Should take maybe an hour. But I've been reading about software architecture. I've been learning about solid principles. And I've been told over and over, make your code reusable. Don't write the same thing twice, which is more or less the dry principle. Simply put, think about the future and create reusability. So instead of building what someone asked for, I built something better. I created a generic filtering system. It could filter by anything. You could filter by price, category, color, size, brand. It had configuration files. It was beautiful. It was reusable. It was future-proof. Took me probably a couple of days to build. A couple of days for a feature that should have taken an hour or two. But Here's the kicker. We never used any of the flexibility I created. We never filtered by color. We never needed to filter by date. We only needed to filter by price. I had built a Formula One race car in the filtering world when all we needed was a bicycle. Now, let me explain why this can be so dangerous, especially for beginners. When someone tells you to make everything reusable, it sounds like good engineering. Reusable code is good code. If you can use it in multiple places, that means it's well-designed, right? Wrong. Here's what actually happens. First, you start adding parameters and options. Instead of a function that does one thing, you make a function that does a couple different things, depending on how you call it. If you're trying to make it reusable, it needs to be able to take generic types. This makes it harder to understand. Someone reading your code has to understand all the possibilities, not just the one they care about. And if you're following the dry principle, you might be adding abstraction, creating classes and interfaces to be flexible, but abstraction has a cost. Every layer of abstraction is another thing someone has to understand or figure out what your code actually does. Third, you add configuration. Instead of hard coding values, which is fine for things you don't change, you put everything in config files or you have enumerations with a bunch of different values. Now someone has to understand your code and the configuration files to understand what's happening. All of this can make your code harder to read, harder to test, harder to change. And for what? For flexibility, you, you probably don't need. Now, does this mean never write reusable code? Absolutely not. I'm not saying don't write reusable code. If you're writing the same thing in multiple places, sure, extract it, use reusability, and make an actual pattern out of it. But wait until you see that pattern. Don't try to predict it. Here's a simple rule I follow. Write the code for the requirements you have, not the requirements that you like imagine. If you have one use case, write the code for that one use case. If you get a second use case later, then make it reusable, not before. This approach is faster, it's cleaner, and ironically, it often results in better abstractions because they're based on actual needs, not imagined ones. Now, bad advice number two is called the 200 lines of disaster myth. All right, this one makes me almost angry because I wasted so much time following it. Let me tell you about one of the worst, like, months of my development career. I was building an API that needed to retry failed requests. Now, these requests were to external services. It's a pretty common problem. Sometimes networks are flaky. Sometimes services have a hiccup. You want to retry a few times before giving up. Now, Python and other programming languages have libraries for this. But I've been told, don't rely on libraries for critical functionality. Write it yourself so you understand how it works. This advice sounded wise. It sounded like what a serious engineer would do. If you're a beginner, don't do it because I tried to write my own retry logic and it was a disaster. First attempt, I made a function that tried something three times in a row, except I didn't add any delay between retries. So, so if a service was overloaded, I was just hammering it three times in a row immediately. That made things worse. 
not better. Second attempt. I added delays, but I made them fixed, always waiting one second between the retries. Except that's not how you should do it. You should use exponential backoffs. Wait one second, then two, then four. I didn't know this at the time. Third attempt. I added an exponential backoff, but I didn't add jitter. Random variations in delay. Without jitter, if multiple requests fail at the same time, they all retry at the same time, creating a thundering herd problem. I didn't know about this either. Fourth attempt, I added jitter, but I realized I needed to handle different types of errors differently. Some errors you should retry, like network timeouts. Some you shouldn't, like unauthorized errors. So I added error handling logic. My new retry logic is now probably 200 lines of code that has bugs and missing features that the library had built in. The library would have done all of this correctly. I could have imported it and used it probably within five minutes. I had wasted time trying to reinvent a wheel that already existed, and my version was significant worse. Now let me explain why this advice is harmful, especially for beginners, unless you want to try and improve and learn. The advice usually goes like, you should understand all of your dependencies. Don't just import random libraries because I have like supply chain vulnerabilities. You need to know what they do. Build it yourself so you really learn it. Sounds reasonable. You should understand your tools. You should understand your dependencies. But here is the problem with that. There's a difference between understanding what a library does and is it safe to use and understanding how to implement it yourself. I can understand what a retry library does. It retries failed operations with configuration strategies. That's what I need to know to use it effectively. I don't need to understand all the edge cases, all the gotchas, all the subtle bugs that took years to discover and fix. And I sure as heck don't need to try and create that myself. Python's ecosystem, for one example, is one of the biggest strengths of using Python. There are libraries for almost everything, and these libraries are usually better than what you would write yourself, or at least within the time constraint that you've given yourself. And that's because a lot of these really popular libraries have been tested by users, debugged over years, optimized for performance, maintained by people who specialize in the problem. Now, does that mean you should just randomly import libraries for everything? No, you should be thoughtful about the dependencies because you don't want a ton of dependencies in your application. But the bar isn't never use libraries. The bar is use well-maintained popular libraries for solving specific problems. Here's how I think about it. If it's a solved problem like retries or validation, date handling, HTTP requests, use a library or framework. Don't reinvent the wheel. The library will be better than your first attempt and your time is better spent on the problems that are unique to your application. If it's a core business logic, the stuff that makes your application different from all the other applications, write it yourself. This is where you add value. This is where you should spend your time. This is where you can't use a library because the problem is specific to you. Now, one more thing about this advice. People will say, but what if the library has a bug? What if the library is not well maintained anymore? Yes, Libraries can still have bugs, but you know what has more bugs? The code you wrote yourself when you're solving a problem for the first time. The library has at least been battle tested, probably for your exact use case. Your code hasn't. And yes, libraries become unmaintained, but popular libraries usually don't just disappear overnight. You have a warning, and if the library is so critical that you're worried about it being abandoned, that probably means other people have had that issue, there's other libraries to use, or maybe that's your opportunity to now create one yourself. All right, now bad advice number three is my code works illusion. This one seems so logical to me when I first heard it. It's probably the advice that cost me most of the hours of my life. <laughs> Let me tell you about a project that went horribly wrong. I was building a payment processing system. This was critical code. If it broke, we lose money and we lose trust with our users. I knew I needed tests. I wasn't questioning whether to add tests or not. I was just going to add the tests later. My logic went like this. The code is still changing. Why write tests for code that might change? I'll get the code working first and then I'll add tests to lock it in at the end. So I spent some time building the payment logic, creating orders, processing payments, handling refunds, dealing with edge cases, and it worked. I tested it manually. Everything looked good. Now it was time to write tests. And that's when I discovered huge problems. My code was untestable. Now I was using Stripe endpoints and everything, but it was untestable because my payment processing function did everything. It talked directly to the database. It called the payment API. It sent emails. It logged things all in like, it wasn't just one giant function. It was like three or four big functions. So to test this function, I would need to, you know, set up like a mock database, you know, mock the payments and API, mock the email service, mock the logging system. And even then I couldn't easily test the individual pieces. The function was like one big blob of logic. To test the refund logic, I had to set up everything too. So what did I do? Well, there's two options. You can just push the PR with no tests, 
or you break the whole thing up into smaller pieces, separating concerns, making things testable. I was now, you know, quote unquote, changing working code, code that I've already tested manually. And guess what happened when I refactored that thing? I broke things multiple times. Changes that I thought were safe weren't, and the manual testing just didn't cover everything. By the end, I spent another probably like week refactoring and fixing bugs, a week that could have been avoided if I written tests from the start. So let me explain why wait until the code is done is such terrible advice for testing. First, done never comes. You never know when the code is done because the goalposts are always moving. Something urgent might come up, a bug in production, a new feature request, a fire to put out, and the tests never get written. I've seen this happen over and over. Code ships without tests because we'll add them later or we don't have them, but later never comes. There's always something more urgent once you wrote the business logic than to add tests, which is simply not true. Second, when you do write tests later, you're testing the code you already wrote, not the behavior that actually needs tested for. Writing tests force you to write better code because to test something easily, it needs to be isolated, focused, and have clear inputs and outputs. That's just good design. So here's what I do now. I don't necessarily do like test-driven development where you write tests first, but I do write tests at least alongside with my code. So like my process typically is like I write a function, then I immediately write a test for it. Then I move to the next function, write a test for that, code test, code test, they grow together. But each time I'm doing a test, I'm testing the behavior of the function, not necessarily the code of the function. Test-driven development is good first, but the benefits of what I do is first, it's, it's faster. When I write a test, right after writing the function, everything is fresh in my mind. I know what it should do. I know the edge cases. I know the behavior and writing the test is fairly quick. Compare that to coming back, you know, after you've spent some days doing something else and trying to come back and write tests for your, your already complete entire feature. It's just so much harder. It's such like a brain shift to now write tests for something that you think already works. Second, it gives me confidence to change things. Let's say I write a test function and test it. Then later I realize there's a better way to implement something. With tests, I can refactor confidently. I make the changes, run the tests, and they pass. I know I didn't break anything. And if I need to change something in the code which changes my test, I then have to change the tests along with it. And this is great to do along with AI. You can break up long requests into more modular requests where you are creating tests along the functional code. Just always know that tests are an investment. They cost a little bit of time up front, but they save so much time in the long run when trying to add new features. Don't write tests after the code is done. The code is never done. Tests don't slow you down. Ultimately, they speed you up. Now, bad advice number four is one line wonders. Man, this got me good. This advice, I mean, I messed up big time and it's embarrassing to admit. I was proud of some code that I shipped before. Um, I'll tell you about it. I was writing a function and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I was working with uh, data processing, taking some raw data, transforming it, you know, filtering it, aggregating it, pretty standard stuff. But I've been learning about Python's advanced features at the time. So I was learning about like list comprehensions, Lambda functions, functional programming patterns, you know, all the cool stuff that makes you sound smart. And I wanted to show off how much, you know, I knew. So I wrote a function that did everything in one line. It used a nested list comprehensions. It used a Lambda functions and a bunch of other clever tricks to transform the data exactly how we needed. It was one line, one beautiful line. <laughs> And I showed it to my tech lead at the time. And he asked me, what does it do? And I explained it. He said, can you rewrite it so you don't have to explain it? That's done. But he, I mean, he was right. The newer version would make it longer. It was less elegant in a technical sense or an ego sense, but it was better code. Let me explain why clever code is such a trap, especially for developers who are learning and wanting to prove themselves. When you're learning to code, you discover these powerful features. In Python, you learn about list comprehensions, you'll learn about Lambda functions, and they'll start feeling like magic. You'll be like, what the heck? How does this work? And this looks awesome. You want to learn about decorators and context managers and generators, and it's all really exciting. But there's a temptation to use all of it, not just when it's needed, but to use it all the time. To write code that shows off to everyone that you're the man, that you're so smart, that people are like, wow, this guy really knows Python. But here's the thing. Code that makes you feel clever when you write it often makes you feel stupid when you have to read it later. Like, it's so hard to read. You need to make sure that your code has clarity. Code is read significantly more than it's written. I mean, think about it. You write a function once, but that function might be read hundreds of times. It might be reread again by you. It might be reread by a, a, a coworker. It might be in a bug. It might be read by your teammates, you know, later down the line who aren't even coworkers right now. 
you need to make sure that your code is clear. Now with that though, let me be like crystal clear. I'm not saying you should never use these advanced features. I'm just saying the PR with your name on it needs to be clear code, which is almost always better than these one-liners, unless these one-liners are normal and common within your group. Now, bad advice number five, I'm calling the 10,001 query problem. This last one is tricky because there's some truth to it, but I took it too far and it cost me. And let me tell you about the time I brought down a production system. I was building a dashboard that showed user activity. Nothing crazy complicated, just displayed how many times each user logged in, what features they used, that kind of thing. I wrote the code and it all worked great. We had about 100 users at the time and the dashboard loaded instantly. I'd heard about like don't pre-optimize and premature and like don't over-engineer so many times. So I didn't think about performance. It worked. It worked fine. I was like, heck yeah, we're good to go. We launched. The dashboard was great. Everyone was happy. This is for an internal application where there's other people using it. That company's department grew from 100 users to 1,000 to 5,000. And I'm not sure if it actually hit 10,000, but it was like on its way to 10,000. And one day someone tried to load the dashboard and it took 45 seconds. Then it timed out. Then our entire database slowed down because my query was so inefficient that it locked the tables. I had written a query that got all the users, then for each user made another query to count their logins. If you don't know what that means, that's called the N plus one problem. For 100 users, 101 queries. For 10,000 users, 10,001 queries. That's a disaster. The fix was simple. You just had to use a join and maybe add some pagination if you needed to. But that wasn't before prod went down. All because I didn't think about performance until I had the problem. I was trying not to over-engineer. Now, again, to be clear, I'm not saying you should never obsess over performance. Because usually when you try and do premature optimizations or over-engineer, it can be dangerous. You spend weeks working on things that don't actually matter. But you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. There's a difference between premature optimization and completely ignoring performance issues. Now, there is a middle ground where you could like kind of design with scale in mind. And that really works like first, ob avoid obviously like bad patterns. Don't make database queries inside loops. Don't load entire tables into memory when you only need a few pieces of data. Don't do the same calculation, you know, a thousand times when you can do it once. You know, little things like that. There, These aren't like optimizations. These are just ways to, you know, write code correct the first time. Second, think about how your data grows, right? Like our code works for 100 records, but I knew there was going to be more users. I knew that we were going to add more people, but I didn't test with it. Like I don't need to create an application that handle a million users, but I should have at least thought like, what if this grows because we're going to grow and what happens if something breaks? Sometimes the answer is nothing breaks. We're fine. Great. Sometimes the answer is a specific query becomes super slow. Cool. Now you know. You don't have to fix it now, but you need to know where you need to look in case you do need to fix it soon. Third, measure what matters, right? So like you don't need to optimize everything, but you should know which parts of your code is slower than other parts. So you know, like, hey, this could slow down. This external service can slow down. Um, a simple logging to track how long database queries can help, you know, how long APIs take can help. Just basic measurements. This way, when something is slow, you know where to look. And then fourth, just try and use obvious, you know, optimizations when they're free. Caching is a great example. If you set like a good TTL and you know how to, and know how you're going to use it. When you're doing an expensive calculation that doesn't change often, just cache it. This isn't a premature optimization. This is just backend 101. <laughs> so like, here's my rule of thumb. You don't need to optimize for a million users right now, but you should avoid patterns that may break um, based on the number of users you need right now. All right, I hope you were able to learn something and I'll see you in the next video.